three share it. Sorry, doing this on a whole new computer today. So just have to get situated with it. All right, so we're going to um, begin for today. Um, just a reminder that um, our test one will be at opening up at nine o'clock. Um, so my plan is to get through as much as we can till about like 8.50. Um, and then I'm gonna stop lecture at that point, um, answer any last minute questions you might have about the exam at that point, and then uh, let you go and take it. Um, like I said um, on the announcement, the uh, test would be will be open note. So you don't need to stay in Zoom to take it. You don't need your camera on to take it or anything like that. Um, I will be around if you do have questions um, about, about the test. Um, but yeah, uh, other than that, oh yeah, the, the last thing I wanted to mention is that the only thing that I really uh, am not allowing is that if you put test questions up online, um, you will get an automatic zero for the test if I find that at all. Um, which would probably mean you would not pass this class because um, we just have three tests in an exam because it's a summer session. So if you get a zero on one test, it's going to be very hard um, to continue on after that. So don't post anything online about this test. All right, so with that, uh, yes, I did get that email and it should be set up. With that, let's um, continue talking about what we were talking about on Wednesday. And on Wednesday, we finished up talking a little bit about um, protein evolution, where we we're looking at sequencing different proteins and then comparing the sequences of proteins that are similar in different organisms and see what amino acids have changed or which ones have not changed. And that tells us information about whether certain amino acids are important for function or not so important for function. So that's where we ended up on on Wednesday. So we just got a few more things to talk about uh, protein evolution here. And that's the, the idea of domains. And when we look at proteins, we often see that they have these things we call domains. And there are sequences that are 40 to 200 residues long, um, and they're conserved throughout evolution. And the thing about domains is that you really, really care that they look the same visually more so than they have the exact same sequence. So what a domain really is, it's a part of the protein that has like function with it. It's, it's a part of the protein that does something. For example, uh, one type of domain is called a zinc finger domain. And what a zinc finger domain does is that it binds nucleotides. And so anytime you see this domain in a protein, you know, okay, that protein is going to bind a nucleotide because it has this domain in it. So that's, that's what a domain is. It's a area of protein that has like a specific structure and function, and they're usually seen in different proteins, the same type of domain. And when looking at different domains, um, if they have greater than 40% the same sequence, same function, less than 25% different functions. Um, and a lot of these domains happen through this idea of gene duplication. Um, and this happens quite a bit in, in organisms where you have a gene and for some reason, that gene just gets copied to a new part of the genome. And 
when it does that, sometimes what happens is that the domain gets copied to a new protein. And that protein gains a whole new function because it, it has this whole new domain attached to it. And it's these domains that are really doing all the work of the protein. Now, over here on the right, I have um, the number of amino acids changes per 100 sites for a specific protein versus uh, years since divergence. So what we're looking at, at on this graph is that you're just comparing different, uh, the same protein in different organisms and just asking yourself, okay, um, have, has this protein mutated a lot? So if you look at the green line, fibronecto, uh, uh, fibrinopeptide rather, you see that they have evolved or are, yeah, evolved a lot, mutated a lot. Um, there's a lot of change in these proteins, depending on what organism you're looking at. Well, something like histone, histone has like never changed. Over a billion years worth of evolution, if you look at different organisms, histones basically have the same amino acid structure. So my first question for everybody here is, why do you think histones have not changed in like a billion years. What is it about histones? They're very stable already, perform optimally. Uh, yeah, for the most part. Um, yeah, they are very stable and they perform optimally. And there's one other reason I was thinking of um, along those lines. Um, and, and there we have it. Um, it needs to keep its ability to package DNA. Um, right, so a histone, if you remember, um, has DNA wrapped around it. DNA is a very simple molecule. Phosphate backbone, sugar, ribose, or sorry, not ribose, deoxyribose, um, and then four bases. This has not changed. DNA is the same as it's been, you know, a billion years ago. Therefore, the protein that interacts very strongly with DNA if DNA doesn't change, there's no reason why this histone should change because it, it's binding the same thing. And in fact, what we actually see is that if a, an amino acid in histone does get mutated, it is actually less effective. Therefore, it makes the organism less fit and that trend, uh, that mutation is not likely to propagate. Um, that's why when you look at histone, uh, you can you can rationalize okay why has this not changed while something like hemoglobin or fibronecto uh, fibrino uh, peptides have and when we look at proteins a lot of the times we can just picture them like uh, it's shown in this image where instead of just like looking at an amino acid sequence, we're more interested in the domain sequence. And so what we're looking at here is the domain layout of multi-domain proteins. And that's proteins, which is uh, different domains on the same peptide chain. And in fibronectin there, you can see a lot of blue uh, fibronectin domains, and that's actually all it is. It's just different fibronecto uh, domains. And the domains themselves um, is that they, they evolve independently of each other. And it's, it's really cool when you look at different organisms with similar domains. Um, 
in that the amino acid sequence can be quite different, showing that that evolution has occurred and that amino acids have been mutated. But they basically look the same, which means they have the same function. However, we don't know the function of every single domain. Um, as I have there on that slide, spacer slash scaffolding. What that means is that it's just causing space between the protein for your protein to work, or is providing a platform for your reaction to be carried out. These things are very hard to determine by just looking at a protein. You have to do um, other type of experiments like doing a, a computer simulation of how your protein works. And then you can start to figure out, okay, in this simulation, we are predicting that this domain is acting like a scaffold or this domain is not actually doing anything in the chemistry, so it might just be a spacer. And that, that question down there, what's the advantages of domains? I'll, I'll just uh, answer that briefly here. Um, domains are a way for proteins to evolve fast because the idea is these domains have function. So if you copy a domain through like a gene duplication, you can automatically gain a new function to a protein, um, which may change fundamentally how that protein acts. So it, it's just a way for evolution to speed up is the big advantage of domains. And with that, that ends our um, PowerPoint from Wednesday. So let me get the one from today up. Let me just pop that up right here. And share my screen. All right. And hopefully everybody can see the bottom of the screen now with this new computer setup, no longer on my five-year-old laptop now. And we are now going to get into uh, chapter six, which is secondary structure. And those of you who uh, saw my window this morning, uh, my, my uh, back, background is actually uh, the different types of uh, domains we are, uh, types of structures in a protein. So showing you primary structure right there. There we go. Secondary structure. Uh, and then behind my head, tertiary and quaternary. So we're going to look at secondary structure, which is right here. And secondary structure is the backbone conformation of a local area of the protein. So it's amino acids and what their backbones are doing is, is the simplest way to put it. And what kind of structure their backbone is making. So here we have, we already talked about primary structure, which is just the order of amino acids. Secondary structure is localized backbone conformation. And to really understand the backbone conformation of proteins, we have to understand the peptide bond. And the peptide bond is usually in trans conformation. And what that means is we're looking at the side chains, right? So here's our peptide bond between two amino acids. So amino acid one and amino acid two, right? And in trans, one amino acid is like pointing down or the side chains point down, the other one's pointing in the opposite direction. Um, and the reason for this is sterics, right? We don't want our side chain atoms to be bumping up against each other. Um, that is, uh, and causing steric interactions, which are unfavorable. So that's why they are dispersed like that. However, proline is special. 10% of proline are actually in the cis conformation. And what that means is that for proline, you could have a peptide bond where the side chains are pointing in the same direction. So my, my question here is, 
based on your knowledge of how um, amino acids look like, and hopefully, hopefully you know what proline looks like because you have an exam in oh, 34 minutes, actually 44 minutes. Um, based on what you know about proline and its structure, why do you think the cis conformation would be okay energetically? because the side chain is bound to the backbone. Yeah, exactly, right? So proline, very good. Makes me happy to know that people are learning their amino acids. That's a very bad drawing of proline, but it gets the point across. Proline side chain comes back and binds on its own uh, nitrogen, um, which means if that for another amino acid, like just alanine or something, or even if you want to make a little more, there's baline. Since proline is bound back on itself, the other side chain is not going to hit it all that much. So there's not going to be that much steric uh, interactions happening. It's still rare, 10% of a chance of a proline being in a cis conformation, but it's still possible. All right, so that's that's the big thing about peptide bonds of the, of the side chains is that they're in trans. Some other things we need to know about the peptide bond. And that is, it has a resonance structure. Normally, when we think about the peptide bond, we think about it having the chemistry here on the left. However, it does have a resonance structure where we have the double bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. So if you remember about resonance structures, it's not like it's either one or the other, it's that it's a combination of the two. So if you were to give percentages, it looks like the peptide bond kind of looks 80% like this, 20% like this. But the big thing is it does have this double bond characteristic so there is no rotation around the peptide bond. This bond does not move. It is stuck there in place because it's like a double bond. However, we do have rotation around um, different bonds. And they, the rotations we talk about in terms of secondary structures are called dihedrals. And what a dihedral is, is that it's an angle made between four atoms. And I think I can show a dihedral better um, by, by actually um, um, stopping sharing and getting me on the big screen again. All right. So imagine, let's see if I can do this. These two pens, I have two pens that are disappearing. So let me put it in front of my face. There we go. These two pens are going to represent my dihedral. The top of the pens, one, two, are two atoms. So let's say this pen is atom one. The top of the pen is atom one. The bottom of the pens are two atoms as well. So atom one, atom two, atom three, and atom four. And the way to look at a dihedral is that atom two and three don't move. So the, the bottom of my pens are gonna be what I turn, turn my uh, dihedral around. And a dihedral is you are measuring the angle between atoms one and four. So who can tell me for the top of my pen what angle am I making? If you look at atom one and four, the top of my pens, what angle is that?
who can guess what angle I'm making? I'm gonna put my arms down for a second. 180, no, um, good guess. It's not because I remember it's the top of the pen. 30, uh, I'm not trying to make 30. I could see how you say that, but I'm trying to make that. Zero, yes, they are right on top of each other. So that is the angle of zero. Okay, so now I have them in an L shape, if I can get it without disappearing. So and they're, if they're in an L shape, what angle is that? If I make a right angle, what angle is between one and four now? There, and my other pen is like that. 90, uh-huh. And if they're up and down like this, that's 180. And then if I make it a right angle on the other side, that's 270. So basically, you're just looking at the angle between atoms one and four, and that's your dihedral. It can go from anywhere from zero all the way to 360 or 359. So 360 is zero. So it, unlike a regular angle with three points, that can only go from zero to 180. With a dihedral, we go all the way from zero to 360 because directions matter for that. Right. So, whoops, let me get back to my screen sharing. So hopefully that makes some sense as to what a, uh, a dihedral is. And when it comes to peptides, there are two dihedrals we care about called phi and psi. So phi, psi. And let me draw a peptide here. So da, da, and uh, carbon alpha C double bond O. So this is amino acid one, amino acid two, amino acid two, amino acid two. And the phi is these four atoms and you're rotating around this nitrogen and uh, carbon alpha bond. And you're just measuring what is the angle between my uh, two uh, carboxylic groups. And then psi is that. So amino acid two, 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 three. Oops, two. So imagine I'm looking at a protein that starts with this amino acid, and then that's what the one, twos, and threes mean. So like just uh, like A, C. So imagine I was looking at a, a, a protein that's alanine, cysteine, and glutamic acid, right? That's what the one, two, threes mean, the order. And then psi is rotating around carbon alpha and carbonyl carbon. And the important thing to know from this idea is that based on the combinations of phi and psi that we get in proteins, we get different structures that are made. And so just by being able to measure phi and psi, I can tell you locally what that, what that protein looks like. That's secondary structure based on fine side angles of the backbone, what structures are you making? Does that make sense? Or is there questions about um, that idea? Just to begin with. And, and we actually have a plot to look at all the phi and psi combinations possible in a protein. And that's what we're looking at here. And this is called a Ramachandran plot. And we have a psi on the y-axis, phi on the x-axis, minus 180 to 180, Personally, I like zero to 360. 
uh, minus 180 to 180 is the same thing. It's just saying the types of dihedral angles we're looking at. And what a Ramachandran plot shows you is it shows you the types of secondary structure you can expect if you had different combinations of phi and psi. What I mean by that is if you look at this region, if you're looking at a protein and you measured, okay, this part of the protein has phi and psi angles that are all in this area. This means you have what's called an alpha helix. This is also what's called an alpha helix, but it's a left-handed helix. These are what are called beta sheets. This is collagen. And there are a lot more areas that are on this Ramachandran that we're not showing you. This is just like the basics. Uh, the blue means very favorable. The green means tolerated. And what I'm showing here on the bottom is um, from my own work when I was a graduate student, looking at uh, fine side combinations of one amino acid combined with all the other 20 amino acids to get in like to see how flexible an amino acid is. So glycine, um, what, what, what this plot is showing is that red is very probable, blue is never seen, uh, and that's, that's a scale, it's a heat map. Um, so blue less probable, red very probable. Glycine is the most flexible amino acid because the side chain is just a hydrogen. So it can have a lot of different backbone combinations. Proline is the most restrictive amino acid because it's actually bound to its backbone. So it has the least combinations of fine psi that we're able to see. So that, that's a Ramachandran plot. It just tells us, you know, if we were looking at a specific fine psi combination, what secondary structure can we expect? And the first type of secondary structure we're going to look at is the alpha helix. And that is what is being shown here. And an alpha helix looks like a ribbon. And the way this ribbon is held together is everybody's favorite interaction, the hydrogen bond. Like I said, if you don't know an answer in biochemistry, just say hydrogen bond and you would have a good chance of getting it right. The way this, this thing's held together is that you have a hydrogen bond between the N plus fourth residue. What that means is that amino acid one is hydrogen bonding with amino acid five, amino acid two with six, so on and so forth. And the hydrogen bond is only between backbone atoms. So the car, uh, carbonyl and the amide of these amino acids are forming these hydrogen bonds. The side chains are these purple, so purple side chains. And in the alpha helix, they are pointing out of the helix and downwards. Inside the helix is nothing. So uh, a common misconception I often see is that people think there might be like water in here. Nope, there is nothing in there. It's just, remember these atoms have actual three dimensional space. So that's what's taking up the space. It's just the backbone atoms. So thinking about alpha helixes, looking at that image, and now that we know some structural information about amino acids, uh, my question for people here is that why would it be very hard for a alpha helix to form containing these amino acids. Or another way to, to ask this question is, what, what do these amino acids have in common that might make it hard to form this nice helix structure? Anyone have any ideas about that?
stair hindrance, and that's exactly what it is, right? All of these amino acids, for the most part, are have big side chains, very long side chains. Um, and even though these amino acids are pointing, the side chains are pointing outwards, they can still hit each other. Um, for example, like, let me get my pen back out. Like phenylalanine, right? And just imagine like you had like another phenylalanine here. They are actually close enough to like start to interact with each other, even though my drawing maybe not doesn't show it all that well. But yeah, stair hindrance. So you can't just have big bulky side chains and that's all you have because they will interact with each other. The side chains are close enough that they could interact with each other. So another question I have about how alpha helices work. Um, proline, proline is called a secondary structure breaker. That's, that, that's what proline is. It breaks secondary structure. What I mean by that is that proline can never be inside an alpha helix. If you tried to put a proline here, the alpha helix would fall apart. And in fact, the only part of a alpha helix that proline can be at is at the end terminus here at residue one. So why can proline not be at any position? Why does it have to be at the very beginning? Why can't it be like amino acid five or six? What, what is it about proline that makes it unable to be in the center of an alpha helix? based on al how alpha helixes are sticking together. Let me just draw proline again. So there's proline. What is proline missing? Bond strain? Um, that's a good idea, um, but it, it's, it's not exactly that um, because um, if we look at the Ramachandran plot, alpha helices are right here. And if we look at proline, proline can be right there as well. It can, it can occupy that, that area. Um, so it's, it's not quite that good. Good suggestion though. Hydrogen, yes. Proline, because it is bound on its own nitrogen, it's missing a hydrogen here. If you notice, that hydrogen is very important in alpha helix because it is hydrogen bonding with carbonyl groups. It's that backbone hydrogen bond that keeps the alpha helix together and keeps all secondary st structure together. Backbone hydrogen bonds are super important. Proline cannot be involved in that on its nitrogen and its amide because it doesn't have a hydrogen. That's why it can be at the beginning because it can still donate a hydrogen bond through its uh, carbonyl group but it cannot be in the middle or the end of the alpha helix. All right, any questions about uh, that information? All right.
Now, the other type of secondary structure that we're really interested in is beta sheets. And there are two different types of beta sheets called parallel and anti-parallel. First, let's, let's just look at what a beta sheet is, and then I'll get into anti-parallel and parallel. A beta sheet is when you have amino acids that are forming lines, more or less, and they are hydrogen bonding with another line of amino acids to form these sheets. So here is one line, and it's hydrogen bonded with another line. This would be like one sheet. And parallel and anti-parallel, what that means is what way the sheets are running from N to C terminus. So on the top sheet here, we are going N to C terminus this way. Whoops. So this, for example, this might be like residue 15, 16, 17. And the other sheet, we are running the opposite direction, N to C terminus this way. So this might be residue like 29, 30, 31. Right, so we're just going in opposite directions. Anti-parallel beta sheets are more stable, the most stable beta sheet, because like the alpha helix, the beta sheet is held together by backbone hydrogen bonds. And when you're anti-parallel, you have the, the hydrogen bond is like 180 degrees if you measure that angle. Which, which makes it stronger. While the anti-parallel, the N and C terminus are running in the same direction. So this would be like 15, 16, 17, and then this would be like 29, 30, 31, right? So we're going in the same direction. These are weaker because since they're parallel, the hydrogen bond is at an angle now. And this angle actually makes a weaker hydrogen bond. Now, to connect these sheets together, we need what is called a turn. And you can have different types of turns. Here's a simple turn that is connecting anti parallel. And you have a more um, uh, 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 extensive turn here to connect parallel. Um, just because how, how they're connected, like if you're anti-parallel, you can make a sharp, what's called a beta turn. Here, you need different types of longer turns to be parallel. What these arrows mean is they're just giving you directionality. So this would be N to C, N to C down here. The, the, the head of the arrow is the C terminus. The beginning is the N. So it's just giving you directionality. So based on what we talked about so far today, um, let's, let's do a little, a little bit of a test here. I have three different peptide sequences, one, two, and three. I want you to try and figure out, and I have a poll for this. Let me pop that up. Which of these three peptides is the least likely to form a beta strand or beta sheet based on the sequences I give you there? Let's see how well you know your one letter codes.
and we'll do like uh, 30 more seconds. So please vote if you have not yet. All right. So looks like we got all the results. Oops. Um, and seems like most people got it right. And it is uh, number two. That's the least likely. And and the 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 way to figure that out is by looking at the sequence and seeing this proline. Remember, proline are secondary structure breakers. They do not have that amide hydrogen. That hydrogen is needed for these hydrogen bonds. So without it, you don't have those hydrogen bonds and you don't have secondary structure. Now, the last thing about beta sheets is that these terms, you can have different types, um, but um, I'm not going to be worrying about if you know type one versus type two. Um, but the, they're, they're shown here just for completeness. So we can kind of just forget about that question why are pro and cli found in beta terms and just know that these, these terms are called beta terms. All right. So any questions about our beta sheet here or anything we've talked about so far? All right, let me just take a look at the next slide to see where we're at. Okay, fibrous proteins. Um, okay, so I think just because it's 845, um, I'm gonna call it here and just open it up. Does anyone have any last minute questions about the test that they would like to know? Anything that you're dying to get off, get off your mind about the test? Can we move between questions? So it's the way it's set up is that you should have all your questions shown at once. And I'm gonna double, now that you said that, I'm gonna double check just to make sure that's that, but I'm pretty sure that's how I set it up. So you, you have all your questions shown to you at the same time. Yep, all at once. Any other questions? Can I explain cation and anion exchangers? Sure. Um, so cation, anion uh, exchange columns. Uh, what these are is that they're columns to purify proteins and they purify proteins based on the charge of the protein. So cation columns bind positive amino acids, 
anion bind negative amino acid. What that means is that a cation column has beads in it that are negatively charged. And anion columns have beads that are positively charged. And the idea is you have a column full of beads. And then you run a, mi a, a mixture of proteins through this column. Let's say we're doing an anion exchange column, right? So the beads are negative in anion exchange. Any proteins that are overall positive will stick to the beads. Anything that's not will go through and be collected. Then to get the proteins that are stuck to the beads off, you add salt, high concentration of salt. And what that salt will do is that it will outcompete the proteins that are stuck to the beads. These proteins will come off the beads and you can collect them. And you have just separated proteins based on what charge they have. So that in a nutshell is how cation and anion exchange works. Anything else? All right, if not, what I'm gonna do then is I'm actually gonna uh, stop the session to kick everybody out. Oh, it looks like we do have uh, one more question. You said cis and tyrosine become negative high pH. Do we know, need to know how high or is it anything above seven? Yes, you do need to know how high, uh, that's their pKa's. It's not every, anything above seven. Like tyrosine's above like 10, they'll become negative. Uh, cysteine's like 9.4. Cysteine, uh, 8.5, so I was off by a whole one pH. Yep, so you need to know those uh, PKs. But luckily, since it is open note, you should have those available to you. Um, but yeah, other than that, like I said, if, if there's no other questions, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop the session, kick everybody out of the room. Then, um, I will open up the test um, and you have one hour to take it. Um, I, I might, I'll probably just sit in this Zoom room if you have like any emergency question, but um, just be aware that I can only take one person at a time um, when answering questions. Um, and so I will, if, if more than one person has a question at the same time, I'm just gonna let whoever the first one in is. So please, and please don't like, if you have a question, uh, feel free to try and log in the Zoom, but don't don't sit there for like five minutes if, I'm, if I have to talk to someone else and not, not work on your test, because you might not have enough time to finish. So if you have a question, feel free to get on Zoom, just mark it. And if I don't let you in right away, just move on with your test. And when I let you in, then you can go back to your question. Um, but yeah, other than that, um, I'm going to kick you all out, open it up. Good luck, everybody. Um, yeah, have fun. I know tests are the most fun you can have in class. So if I don't see you today, see you on Wednesday.